Now the day has come, we are all together in this place, captivated by a shining, joyful light, drawn to the warmth we find in one another. May the Spirit stir afresh in our midst. May our common vision be restored. May our dreams of daring be reawakened. We are called to be the church. We are not alone. Our opening hymn this morning. Our opening hymn this morning is on our song sheet that was passed out to you. That's joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. <laughs> Be with you all. And also with you. Almighty 
God, to you all our hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Stood up in the heat. 
the depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with the wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In your steadfast love, you led the people whom you redeemed. You guided them by your strength and your holy abode. You brought them in and planted them on the mountain of your own possession. The place, O Lord, that you made your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, that your hand has have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gradual hymn is hymn number 649, found in the common phrase hymn book. Breathe on me, breath of God, 649.
Christ according to John. Lord, 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 Jesus Christ. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears the fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appoint you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I have given you these commands so that you may love one another. The Gospel of Christ. Speak in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. I want to start with a couple examples of how things that are meant well and that, that are good things in and of themselves can get kind of muddled up. Because it seems to be one of the things that humanity is pretty good at taking a good thing and kind of having to go sideways. A number of years ago when I worked for the government of Alberta in the environment department, they kept changing the name, but it was environment. They decided they were going to set priorities because there were too many things going on, too many projects, nothing could get all the resources it needed, so they're going to set some priorities. So they had a big meeting with all the staff and the deputy minister and the assistant deputy ministers all stood up and made their little speeches about the importance of priority, and they kept focusing on how it wasn't just about what we were doing, it was about what we were going to have to stop doing if it wasn't a priority. Well, I noticed that the list that they each gave were a little bit different, and I stupidly stuck up my hand and, and asked about that, which was, it was kind of fun, and they still kept me around after that. But what happened is, of course, the idea was that we were all going to go back and figure out the things that we were going to not do. Well, some of you who have worked for a large organization might see this coming. All the terms of reference for all the various projects that we were involved in, policy development and all that stuff, got rewritten so they neatly fell under the prior priorities that were listed. 
even if it took a bit of a stretch to see how we get that. So we ended up, you'll learn, we will probably won't be that surprised to ensure that, to, you won't be that surprised to hear that in the end, absolutely nothing changed. We did exactly what we were doing before, and we just carried on as we were, and, and they, I think they had to redo it one every year. They would redo the priorities, and everybody would just scramble to rewrite their terms of reference so it fit. Another example, this one perhaps some of you may remember, the 1990s was declared to be the decade for evangelism in the Anglican Church of Canada. Most of you, I suspect, were around at that time. It started with a fair amount of enthusiasm, and everybody agreed that it was a good idea. But as some of you might recall, once it got going, the first thing that happened is we put a lot of energy into figuring out what did and did not constitute evangelism. And, and the conclusion seemed to be that everything fell under the title of evangelism or could be made to fall under it. So in the end, by about 1994 or 1995, people just declared what they did was evangelism and carried on just like they were before. Now again, those are not bad things to do, to have priorities. It's not a bad thing to do evangelism, but Gotta have some meaning, not just have kind of some sounds good isn't enough. Well, due to either good or bad luck with the timing, I've ended up preaching on the last of the series of Fruits of the Spirit, and I get to preach on love. There's an old joke about a man who comes home from church and his wife asks him how it was. It was fine. What did the preacher have to talk about? Sin. What did he have to say? He was against it. You can switch that around and say, what was the sermon about? Love. What did he have to say? Well, he was in favor of it. That's true, by the way. I am in favor of it. Rather a fan of it. But just as in the two examples previously mentioned, it only gets us so far to say, of course we have to be loving. It doesn't, if it doesn't have a lot of meaning under it, some solid stuff underneath it, it doesn't provide us for much guidance in our journey of faith, in our Christian journey. Love, of course, is a word that, that is used to cover a huge range of emotions, a huge range of actions, a huge range of things that people clump under it. Often in the church, we end up using Greek words or Hebrew words in an attempt to narrow it down, and I've been guilty of that myself over the years, but I'm not sure it helps as much as all that trying to keep track now. Probably not doing Eros here, but maybe Billy off to worry about it. But there are different kinds of things that fall under that. There is love that has to do with attraction, which may or may not involve an element of sexual attraction. To be honest, it can be great fun, as long as it doesn't, we don't get ourselves into trouble by making poor decisions. There's a whole publishing industry built around managing when the fireworks fade a little bit and the realization that the other person, the object of all our ardor, might in fact pass gas or need a shower from time to time. That's kind of shock for some people. But let's be honest, that sense of giddiness and being overwhelmed by our feelings for the person, it's pretty good, it's fun, it's good stuff. But most of us know that it doesn't last more than a little while, and it hasn't turned into something else. It'll probably fade away until the next one comes along. Adjacent to this, what I think it's worth mentioning, is the kind of love we might have for a type of food or a place that's important to us, or a song. And it sounds odd to use the same words, but I think some of the same kind of emotions are involved. But there's more. There's love within a family, the love of a parent for a child and vice versa. Much of the time it's solid and reliable and healthy and a, a thing of great beauty. It's really what's kept our species around for so long. It's what gets us up at all hours to respond to a crying child, to spend hours snuggling and playing, to travel across the country to see an aging parent and make sure they're all right to replace their mitts for the fourth time in a week, to clean up the park at 3 a.m. 
I don't know too many parents who haven't said to themselves, you better do something cute real fast, buddy, because I'm running out of patience. <laughs> then there's the love for a friend. No, there's, in friendship, there's less of a desire to possess or control, but, but to be with and to support through challenges and joys. There's a little more distance involved in friendship than in a family or in romantic love. That's why probably a lot more people have lifelong friends than they do lifelong partners. <laughs> and then there's the love we find in a group of people. Cohesiveness, support, belonging. Churches do this fairly well sometimes. Not always, let's be honest, but it's part of what we strive for. I'm sure there's a lot more, and I could go on, and my goodness, if you look at the Facebook feed, there's all sorts of people who put stuff up about, they think it's great wisdom, some of it is, about love, some of it's just kind of treacly. I will admit I have an allergy to sort of treacly stuff. <laughs> Although I do like honey and molasses and corn syrup. <laughs> I don't imagine there's anything in that, though, that most of us haven't had at least some experience and some familiarity with. So what does God come into this? And of the various things that the word love refers to, which of them is the fruit of the Spirit that we're referring to? <clears throat> well, the easy but perhaps less helpful answer is all of them. God has created a world with many sensations and many people, and God has created us with the ability to experience strong, positive emotions around people and experiences. It's a wonderful thing. And I'm delighted that God made us this way. I can't imagine a world where I couldn't feel the way I do about blueberry pie, or about my children, or, or my wife, or some of the good, long, fond friends. But some people are hard to love. And sometimes when we love people, it calls us to do things that are not easy and are not always happy and smiley and, and they don't feel very positive when we do them. One of the guidelines I use when I read the Bible is that if God commands us to do something, if Jesus commands us to do something, there's a pretty good chance we wouldn't necessarily do it if we were left to our own devices. Jesus commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves. To love one another as I have loved you. He tells us that there is no greater love than to give up our life for another person. And I would assume from that that the other people might not cut so much love if it were just left up to us. Because there are times, and again, many of us will know this already, I'm not assuming this is new information, there are times when loving someone means not just being a supportive presence, but someone who loves someone enough to call them out when they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. To be willing to put our love and friendship on the line rather than let them continue to make poor choices. To love them enough to hold them accountable for some of the things that they have done, that they ought not to have done. Sometimes we have to love them and we have to love ourselves enough to walk away. That's really hard to do. There's no guarantee in this world that they will react well and thank us when it's over. That happens in movies, but that's why we go watch movies. It doesn't always happen in real life. Again, many of you will know that. People need pruning, as it sets out in the gospel. Pruning sounds kind of nice and pastoral and Little old English ladies puttering in the garden, you know, while they have their tea. And I bet pruning is much fun for the plant. Hacking off the bits that, that, that aren't doing well. And I know it's no fun for a person who's called to change something about their life that they would rather not change, or that they would find difficult to change. The Bible overall is a story of a group of people God chose to do God's work of restoring the world to something like what God had in mind for it, that creation. Adam and Eve didn't get past chapter 2 before they messed up. 
God tried again and, and we messed up again. God called Noah and Abraham and Moses and David and then a whole series of prophets to remind people of God's love for them and they called them back to the way they were supposed to act and show God's love in this broken world. And it's a pretty sad story of failure. Sometimes spectacularly, often in petty ways. The remarkable thing when you read, particularly read your way through the Old Testament, is that God stuck with his choice of this group of people. And despite their repeated failures, loved them through all their stupidity and violence and lust and greed and their lack of faithfulness. God did it not because they were wonderful and earned it. The people who crossed the Red Sea were no nicer people than the Egyptians who got mired in, in the mud and, and drowned. But because God chose to love them and God chose not to give up on them when most of us would have. Sometimes that love meant that they needed pruning. There's some harsh stuff in the Old Testament. If you think God's all nice and fluffy and happy, well, I can show you a few passages in the Old Testament where it doesn't work that way. But sometimes that love meant that God had to turn them over to the enemies when they wouldn't stop being unfaithful. Sometimes that love meant that God had to prune them, sometimes painfully, to call them back. But it was always with love and always with the goal of getting them back into the covenant of love that God had for them, for us. One of the hard truths of the Christian faith is that even all of us, even the good ones, even the ones we love that are easy to love, the ones we look to as examples of a good life, well lived, all of us <clears throat> are sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God and who stand in need of God's grace. Some people fail in more dramatic ways, some in less. None of us measure up. I hate to be the one to break it to you. But the good news is that all of us, in spite of these failures, are loved by God, and all of these people are to be loved by us if we're obedient to God's call. And that's where the spirit comes in. Because I don't know about you, but I don't have the wherewithal to love all the people I know. It's easy for some. Some, it's, well, it's a little more challenging. Others, I cannot even imagine how I could make that work. But for the grace of God. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to encourage us and guide us and give us the strength to love the people that God has put in our lives. Not to love them, not just by thinking nice thoughts about them from time to time, but really deeply caring for them and for their lives. The bar is set pretty high. The reading from Galatians tells us the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't know about you, but I could probably do one or two of those well, but ask me to do that whole list regularly. I know. I don't think I can do that. I know I can't. So where does this leave us? God asks us to love the wounded and sinful people around us as our response to God's love for us in our woundedness and our sinfulness. Say that again, because I think it's an important thing to know. God doesn't just say, you know how to do this, call up someone. God says, I love you with all your sins and all your faults and all your foibles and all the nasty things that you don't think I know about. I love you. And once that soaks in, and that, that takes some time, a lifetime, really. Suddenly, it maybe gets a little harder to be as harsh on the people around us. We're not asked to do it because we're good at this stuff. Quite the opposite. We're bad at it. 
once we accept that and accept God's love for us while we were still sinners, it can help us to open our hearts to God's guidance and encouragement and support as we struggle to make that real in our lives. God knows how bad we are at that, that stuff. That's why God reaches out to us. That's why God sent his son to die for our sakes, not when we were at our best, but when we weren't. I can't do that, but I can try. It can be hard, but it's worth it, and we aren't left alone as we muddle through. The fruits of the Spirit are real. They're hard to do sometimes, but they're worth it. And for that, I give God thanks. Amen. <coughs>
We also at this time give thanks for memorials given in memory of Bell Sangster, given by David and Charlene McGinnis, Pat Haddad, and Harvey and Barb McPhail. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the peace of the world. The Lord grant that we may live together in justice and faith. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for Canada, and especially for uh, the King, for the Governor General, for the Prime Minister, and all in authority, that the Lord help them to serve this people according to his holy will. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for children and young people. The Lord guide their growth and their development. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the sick. The Lord deliver them and keep them in his love. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who are condemned to exile, prison, harsh treatment or harsh labor, for the sake of justice and truth. The Lord support them and keep them steadfast. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. We remember the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and all who have borne witness to the gospel. The Lord direct our lives in the same spirit of service and sacrifice. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray to you, Lord, for the give you thanks for the love that you have given us. We ask that you help us to share this love with others around us, especially to those who need it the most. This we ask in the name of your Son, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Continue on page 191. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Lord, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand, if we're able, for the peace. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. We share God's peace.
best wills to use your family well, that the whole human family, today and in generations to come, may with us give thanks for the riches of your creation and for the abundance of your blessings. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen.
sing your praise, Almighty Father, through Jesus our Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Glory to you forever and ever. Amen. On page 211, we use the form at the bottom, the traditional form for the Lord's Prayer. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
gray. At the bottom of page 214, all your works praise you, O Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. Gracious God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we who share his body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We who in spirit lights give life to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so that we and all your children shall be free. And the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I suspect there may be an announcement or two. Uh, we missed Irvin, that's for sure, but I think he's doing okay. But uh, so I'm just going to, these announcements will be a little bit shorter today than normally. First of all, I've been asked by uh, Christ Church, Anglican Church, they're having a fall fair. And it's on October the 5th. So jot that down. Fall fair on October the 5th from noon until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We're accepting donations for the Victor County Food Bank. Uh, there's going to be yard sale, games, hamburgers, hot dogs, baked beans and brown bread for nine dollars. But if you want the beans and the brown bread, you have to pre-order. Okay, so there's a phone number that's here. I'm going to post that in the back of the bulletin board there, so you can write that phone number down. Uh, this is to help feed the fifth of Andy families. October the fifth, from noon to five at Christ Church. I'd like to thank uh, Reverend Keith and Reverend Joanne for being with us here this morning. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming out to the uh, uh, joint services that we have. It's great to see a large number of people in the church, be it St. Keith, be it Christ Church, be it St. James. It's just a wonderful way to get together as friendship and love. I know in the hall there's some uh, tea or whatever going on and some snacks. If you snacks there, please stay and join with us. Reverend Keith. Thank you. And I feel strongly that carrot cake really counts as a salad. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, you can see where that got me. So I the best, I may not be the best person to take nutritional advice from. <laughs> but in any case, thank you. And, uh, I'll, I, I do wander to other churches while I'm not here, down at uh, Three Harbors and the Eastern Shore and so on, but it's always good to be here. So we'll stand for the blessing and then have our final hymn. Go in peace and grace. Startle the world with the power of your story, the sound of your joy, and the signs of your love. Blessed to us is the journey before us. Blessed to us are the friends who travel with us. Blessed to us is the company of Christ on the way. Amen. Amen. Our closings are on the song sheet that we have, which was passed out to you. You are the vine, and we're going to follow that with uh, May God's blessing, which we're going to use it. You are the vine.
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.